When did the first schism of the church happen? I'll tell you when. The first day that Jesus ever opened his mouth. We had a major conference every October, around October 31st, to celebrate the Reformation in Wheaton. The first year we had a thousand registered people for this conference. If I named the speakers, they were a who's who of evangelical preachers. The third year of this event, I announced next year's conference will have as its theme one holy Catholic church from the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to talk about the unity of Christ's body. There was an audible gasp. I had students from several Bible schools come up angry after I was done preaching that afternoon and tell me how dare you use words like that? How dare you have a conference on this subject? Once the cat was out of the bag, that unity was a major component of what I was saying. The crowds went away. The money went away. My entire staff had to be laid off. My salary had to be dramatically cut. I was being quoted in the books of some well-known authors who said of me, I had lost faith, I had denied faith, I would no longer had confidence in Christ or the scripture, I was the person who should be avoided as a false teacher. My last Sunday in the pulpit, I'm totally confused as to how to preach my final sermon, and I end up preaching John 17, 21, and until that Sunday, I never understood it. I had it all figured out, that unity was with true believers, and true be only true believers could have unity, and I knew who they were, because they used Jesus' words the way I did. So I preached it. In John 17, 21, Jesus prays that all his disciples, they would all be one. He says it three times, that they would be one, that we would be one. Why? Because he says, when we live this oneness with each other, the world will see it and then see who God is. A year ago, the board of Act 3 Network, the ministry of which I have the privilege to be the founder and president, met in Wisconsin to consider the future of the ministry that we are committed to, a ministry for Christian unity. And for the next three days, we sensed and now we're convinced that God was leading us to begin a community that would affirm a covenant and a way of life together. And the people who would make up this community would be lay people, pastors, priests, ordinary Christians, educated, uneducated. We would covenant to give ourselves to a vision to spread the message of Christ's prayer for unity by living it, by telling stories about it, and by encouraging others not to just think about unity or argue about unity, but to do unity. We covenant together to live in an intentional initiative to practice deep and growing friendship with God and others that the love of Jesus might exceed all divisions. Here, here. That's pretty good. Amen. We're close. Nothing mortified Paul and these young early Christian congregations more than the fact that Christian would fight and argue and quarrel with fellow Christians. Are some for Paul, or some for Apollos, or some for Christ? In every letter of the New Testament, there is division. As the church grew and spread, then forces of disunity inevitably came in. One of the big controversies, which had to be resolved by the Council of Jerusalem, is whether you had to become a Jew in order to become a Christian original split in the early church was actually between the Jewish believers in Jesus and those who were not Jewish. The early theological controversies which eventually became church dividing really all centered around that question of who is Jesus. Constantine was that first emperor who for the first time had the resources to be able to bring together different Christians in order to bring about unity. There are seven ecumenical councils. 
The first one is 325, and that is the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea produced what we call the Nicene Creed. In 451, yet another council is called. This is the famous Council of Chalcedon, which gives us the basic final formula about Jesus' divine and human nature. The last one is in the year 787, which also takes place in Nicaea. Breaks in unity continue to be an issue. The East is fairly stable because the Byzantine Empire is intact. The bifurcation really begins at 800. That's where in Bulgaria, where you had Western and Eastern missionaries who were kind of butting heads up, and they really noticed, it, noticed the profound differences. The 1054 schism was really the end of a very, very lengthy separation and divorce process between the Eastern Christians and the Western Christians. You have debates, century after century after century, centering on one person, Jesus. Who is Jesus? As a result of a growing apart, the two sides of the Roman Empire, East and West, really don't know each other. They don't have any relationship anymore. The koinonia has been broken just practically in that they, they're not living together and they don't know each other. One is speaking Greek, the other is speaking Latin. Christianity developed in the West as a Latin-based Christianity. And so it just made things, the way that the two churches looked at Christ, the way they understood not only liturgical worship, but some very fundamental theological concepts that affect Orthodox spirituality, our prayer life, monasticism, all their understanding of all those things, you know, they began to diverge. What happened in 1054, the, the Pope sent a legate to the Patriarchate of Constantinople. His name was Cardinal Umber. He conveyed that there is one head of the church, the Bishop of Rome, and that the, the Church of Constantinople should submit to that authority. Eastern Christians looked at the Western Christians as heretics because they believed that the Holy Spirit proceeded both from the Father and the Son. For the Western Christians, they looked at the Eastern Christians and thought, you are the heretics. The reaction of the Orthodox was, if you were to be a father to us, what father speaks to a son in such a way? But we would view each other as brothers. And then, of course, there was the famous scene where Cardinal Lambert during the Divine Liturgy at Hagia Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom in Constantinople, placed a bull of excommunication on the altar of the great church. And as the story goes, a, a deacon followed after him and begged him to take it back, and he refused. And so the Patriarch of Constantinople was anathematized. And of course, Constantinople followed suit. The same thing with the Bishop of Rome. Here in Boston, we are the stewards of a very particular treasure. And that treasure is the love and trust that's been built over generations between different Christian denominations. In particular, between the Greek Orthodox metropolis and the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston. This treasure is something grown by God, but tended by us. The Paschal Vigil will begin around 11 p.m. and we're moving towards midnight when the light comes from the tomb, which is the, the altar of, of Christ. So it's at that Paschal Vigil, Cardinal O'Malley, who is the, the head of the Roman Catholic Church here in Boston, will come along with a member of the clergy and with his entourage. He's received at the, the doors of the cathedral, escorted to the Solea. Here, this is that area in front of the altar. As you get close to midnight, the chanting will stop. The Metropolitan, the bishop, will read his encyclical for Pascha. And he has the Episcopal candles are called the Tricaron and the Dicaron. It is the, the tri-candle and the di-candle. Three candles in his right hand, two in his left. The Trinity, the two natures of Christ, which is Chalcedon, the Fourth Ecumenical Council. And he turns around with those candles and he proclaims and chants 
come receive the light. Efta lavatafos, come receive from the light, the light from the light. And the first candle that he will light is that of the cardinal. And so the cardinal will come forward, receive the light from his candle. And then that light, that flame is distributed throughout the church. So the church that was in darkness is now illumined just by candle, by all the candles of the hundreds and hundreds of people that filled this cathedral. It is remarkable that at this moment, which is really an intimate moment between the entire community of the Greek Orthodox Church, where they are gathering in the dark to light their candles from the Paschal candle, the Easter candle, which symbolizes the resurrection and can only be lit when the proclamation of Easter resurrection rings forth. At that intimate moment, they are going to open the service to their brother from a church that has been out of communion with them since the year 1054. As in every church, there are people who resist ecumenical dialogue, and that's, that, that's fair. I mean, it's, it's always a legitimate concern, but sometimes it also expresses a sense of weakness, because if we're strong about our convictions and who we are, if we know who we are, then there should be no fear of dialogue. It should be an open discussion, and in that way, it will help inform and help us better articulate who we are, and in the differences even, because even in the differences, we can find out a better understanding of who we are as we all strive towards that authentic Christianity. My brothers and sisters, Christos Adensi, for me it's a joy and a privilege to represent the Catholic community here tonight, to be able to wish all of you a happy Easter, and to say how grateful we are for your presence, for your witness, for your friendship. It's always very nourishing for me when we proclaim the resurrection together, that's what God wants us to do. To say, there really is an empty tomb. Jesus really is alive. That's the proclamation the church has been making for 2,000 years that Jesus wants us to do together according to his own will expressed in John 17, 21. When we were yet hostile to God, Romans 5, 10, he reconciled us to himself. So the problem is hostility, it's not division. This problem of hostility is why repentance is so important, is so crucial to reconciliation. Discussion, theological discussion is insufficient because we have wounds sometimes that we do not understand. And those wounds are not addressed by agreeing on doctrine. Because the problem is that we have offended one another. Mm -hmm. In the history of Christianity, there have been huge offenses. There, have been, there has been blood shed. And I think that we carry that even if we don't consciously remember it. And it can only be addressed through repentance. It cannot be addressed doctrinally. And the effort of reconciliation is to put an end to hostility and then heal the wounds that have been caused by past hostilities. Within the Western Church itself, there were some schisms. And so there's some movements that occur around people like John Wycliffe in uh, England and Jan Hus, who start to call for the need for a spiritual renewal. There's also the uh, calls from cardinals and bishops within the Catholic Church, again, saying we need to have a spiritual renewal. Religious orders uh, in the 1200s are founded. The Franciscans and the Dominicans are all precisely about dealing with divisions. And so there are these impulses towards repairing the brokenness that is existing uh, in the Western Church. It's always interesting to me that there were five Lateran councils and they produced a great body of work, but every one said, we're being called in order to deal with reform in the church. And every one of them fails to do it until you get to the fifth Lateran council. Number five, call this council to bring about reform. And it doesn't happen. The fifth Lateran council closed in the fall 
1517. I think what was happening particularly with Luther was that he saw one or two abuses very clearly, and particularly the thing which sparked off 1517 and all that was the sale of indulgences. And the sale of indulgences came in on the back of the medieval doctrine of purgatory, and the medieval doctrine of purgatory grew and swelled and dominated the horizon. If you, if you look at what was going on in the 14th and 15th century, many, many people, when they thought about Christianity, they thought about how, how many years am I gonna have to do in purgatory? As Luther said, it's not what Christianity is all about, but it seemed to be dominating, so he protested. Once we started the food fights of the Reformation, we stopped teaching contemplation. One of the reasons the Reformation had to happen is that by the 14th, 15th century, this was being taught less and less even in the monasteries, and why I think Catholicism became so corrupt and so dualistic. There are people who hate Rome and everything that it stands for. There are people who feel like they are being economically abused. There are people who don't like the political establishment. So Luther comes along at this time. He becomes the person who is the poster child for you can be more. When Thomas first had this idea of Wittenberg 2017, I, I looked at him and said, Thomas, that's a beautiful idea, but we're two lay people from Texas. The 500th anniversary of the Reformation will be in my lifetime. And I thought, what are the odds of that if you take that span in any man's life, the very small chance that it would fall across that. So at that time, uh, I said to Amy, it would be appropriate if there was a prayer meeting in Wittenberg of different streams of the body of Christ. And so I don't know how this will happen. That didn't deter Thomas, he's an optimist. invitation to come, not just with Lutherans, not just with evangelicals, not just with one stream, but with all of the streams, was pretty significant. I said, please, find me a way to give a talk <laughs> on October 31st, 2017. I've been here so many times, I can't not be here on the big day. There are people here, clearly pilgrims of a sort, Protestants, I suppose, from all over the world who are intending to visit the famous sites for the famous day. The original vision for what would happen in 2017 in Wittenberg was very simple, a prayer meeting that would be both Protestant and Catholic, and would grieve the division and pray John 17 with Jesus. What happened far exceeded any <laughs> anything we could have ever imagined. I'm very, very deeply encouraged, and I know that your prayers will be heard in heaven. We had representation from Protestant, Catholic, but also Eastern Orthodox, Anglican, Evangelicals, uh, Anabaptists, and Messianic Jews. We had all generations, from people in their 80s down to people who were eight. Today was a joyful day because we watched the official celebrations. Here we remember Martin Luther and his role in the reformation of the Christian church. And they were just beautiful. There was a Catholic bishop there. The Lutheran bishop sent greetings to the Pope with warm affections. The real failings of the Lutheran church were acknowledged and the persecution of Anabaptists and the anti-Semitism of Luther was acknowledged openly. Here we are in Wittenberg talking about reconciliation between Christians of all denominations, but of course the Jewish people have a very sad history here in Germany. And I'm sort of representing Jews who believe in Jesus by being part of this group. So I come to this amazing meeting where we're bringing people together in repentance and reconciliation, rejoicing that God is restoring the unity and the beauty of his body, the bride, the bride of the Messiah. Turn to your neighbor and 
And I really love that phrase that Pope Francis used where he talks about a reconciled diversity where we share our gifts, the gifts from our different traditions together. In some ways it's this necessary step, like we had to get to this point so we can move on. And I really do feel the sense that we're going to take a leap forward. It's, it is a new day for the church to grow in its oneness and its visible unity to work towards Christian unity and reconciliation by starting with friendship and starting with, you know, can, can we just pray together? What he wants to, to communicate to us is an encouragement. Aber was er uns mitteilen möchte, ist eine Ermutigung. That breakthrough is in perseverance. It feels like a little taste of heaven because we have different languages and different backgrounds, people with their own ministries, their own agendas, and yet there is a great sense of unity. We had planned a Shabbat meal, and we had some Messianic Jews with us who came, and they were going to do a simple symbolic bread and wine Shabbat. And there were about 60 young people from the ages of 13 to 20 in the hall who started this Jewish dancing. And we went for 45 minutes, three rings around the room, and it was so much joy. And I will never, ever forget seeing a ring of Amish men with linked arms pass in front of a ring of Messianic Jewish men with the skull caps passing by the other side. Like, this is, this is heaven. I see greater hope now in this generation for the cleansing and healing of the foundations. The Bible says, what can the righteous do if the foundations are destroyed? Well, this is a time for the cleansing and healing of the foundations. This is a time in which I feel a great privilege to be alive. affirm the wonderful truths that Martin Luther discovered by faith alone, by scripture alone, and uh, through Messiah alone. But it grieves me, the, the splits and the, especially the wars and the European destruction that took place after that. So I think if we could come back to a better understanding of who Jesus is, and especially from his own Jewish context, then we have to be who we are and celebrate the, the differences in our traditions. I was born and raised here in Walhausen in a very Catholic environment as my family uh, was the ruling family so all the villages surrounding us are Catholic. I'm raised up in a very little small village in Castell but in a big castle and I'm raised up Lutheran Protestant. It was in 1535, right at the start of the Reformation in Europe, when a group of Anabaptists took over the city of Münster by force. All the Catholics were expelled, including their bishop, von Waldeck. This infuriated the Catholics, of course. So Bishop Waldeck rallied an army to lay siege to the city for almost a year. With most Anabaptists within Münster starving, the city fell to Waldeck's army. Three of the Anabaptist leaders were tortured and killed. Their bodies were hung in cages at the cathedral.
I knew the story because my father's born in Münster. And so the cages he showed me when I was a child. Philippa's mother comes from the Waldeck family. So as we heard that the Catholic Church was seeking reconciliation for this as part of Katholikentag, the annual Catholic conference, which takes place in Münster this year, we were very much moved. And we had the desire to have a reconciliation liturgy in the St. Lamberti Church in Münster, where these cages still hang to this day. I will be attending the event on Friday with a small group of Anabaptist and Lutheran leaders who are staying here in our home. I was a, a part of a group of, of leaders who were invited from the Mennonite Church to be a part of this gathering there in, in Munster. And we gather together and have a chance to spend time again in the context of Prince Michael and Philippa's place. Yes, Lord, what does it mean for this gathering in Munster to be a gathering of individuals with open hearts? In that context then, partway through, some German Anabaptist leaders come and join us, a Dutch Anabaptist leader comes and joins us, and we begin to interact as a team, but we had never all met each other before. I don't know how to put it into words, it was just a, an incredible experience of being with a family, getting to know that family, but then also being able to pray with and for that family in the context of what they were already involved in, what they were doing. Uh, and that kind of set the stage, really, for what we were going to do as we went up to Munster. be an experience in Munster in these next days of hearing and seeing as you are resident. These are historic events that have never happened before. They may have happened other places, but in this particular place, as I understand it from Philippa, this had never happened before. Catholics, Anabaptists, Lutherans, all together in worship with the liturgy, but all of them up front participating and leading the liturgy. We want to ask God and each other for forgiveness for the reciprocal violence and persecution between Roman Catholic, Evangelical and Anabaptist Christians in Münster in the years 1534 to 1535. The three Anabaptist cages hanging above on the tower of the Lamberti Church in all their cruelty serving as a reminder of these transgressions. It was kind of surreal, like, I'm here, I'm connecting in this context with people who are linked to my past. Let the Anabaptist cages on the steeple of Lamberti Church be an admonition and a reminder to us today. Never again shall Christians use violence against each other. Lord, help us to not see them anymore as a sign of irreconcilability, but rather as a reminder for peace among ourselves. Here we are together and watching the Spirit of God move to bring reconciliation between strangers, but who are connected by history. We feel deep regret and pain over the persecution of the Anabaptists by the Lutheran authorities and especially that this persecution was supported theologically. We ask God and our Mennonite, sisters and brothers, for forgiveness. I've read through my lines and it hits me. I'm here, in this church, as a part of a significant historic event. And I, I mean, really honestly, I was moved to tears standing up there, wanting to keep my composure. There's still other parts I have to do, but recognizing this is more than I imagined. Here, today in Münster, we as Mennonites regret the words and deeds of those past Anabaptists who contributed to the destruction of the body of Christ. You have to imagine kind of back 500 years, this all happened. There's this division, this split, this, you know, we're enemies. From enemies to reconciliation. How does that happen? Catholics can express a willingness to repentance. Ask for forgiveness for all sins that we have committed against Mennonites.
Call for God's mercy and call upon God's spirit for a new relationship to the Mennonites today. And maybe a place for us to look at is, is there something we can learn? we know we have differences. Now what's interesting to me as a Catholic looking in on the Reformation from the outside is almost immediately the Reformation experiences disunity between Germany and Switzerland, and then, of course, with the third phase of the Reformation with the Anabaptists. Somehow, you know, separate that out from the totality of the... So, right at the outset, again, there's this kind of ripping apart that takes place. If you look at the Marburg Colloquy, where Luther and Zwingli come together and they say, look, if we're really going to reform the church, we can't be breaking up into all the, these little groups. We've got to make this work. And they almost did. They almost were able to come to agreement on reformed doctrine until they got to the doctrine of the Eucharist. And in that moment, we see what is still a permanent split in Protestantism because they couldn't come to that agreement. The failure of Marburg really hardened everything, Lutheran to Zwinglian, Protestant to Catholic, everybody to Anabaptist. It hardened all of that into a stance of polemics, where you were no longer treating the other in relationship, you were simply attacking their ideas and defending your own identity over and against them question of the Eucharist, Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, obviously sends shivers down the spine of people from the Reformation period onwards. And it's only when we get past that and say, what do we actually think this is about? And sit down in, uh, in friendship to, to have that conversation, that then we realize we really do agree about so much. Jesus cares deeply about communion, right? Like, it's the, it, it's the one thing that he sort of instituted uh, you know, do this in remembrance of me. So I actually do think he cares about how we do it. Now, the question is, we're not really entirely 100% sure what the mind of Jesus is about communion, because none of us have the opportunity right now to ask him about it. And so, you know, one of us is probably right, <laughs> but we're not sure who it is. So in the meantime, I think we ought to hold our convictions strongly and at the same time figure out, is there some way we could come to an agreement? Once we can understand the prayer for unity is absolutely sincere, is the height of Jesus' teaching, but that it is not a prayer for uniformity, then I think we can go much farther down this path. In fact, as Paul says in Corinthians, uh, unity in the spirit is precisely the unity between different members of the body. Uh, maintaining their difference and only different perspectives can ever I think begin to uh, like the facets of a diamond can begin to reflect the infinite glory of God. People may not understand why the doctrine of the Eucharist is so important to Christians. They don't necessarily have to if they can see that here's a group of people who, who have his deep historical divisions 
who've managed to commit to live well together, to listen to each other, to share a common life despite divisions, not by papering over divisions, but by saying that doesn't finally determine our relationship. When I go up to receive the Eucharist and Daniel, he'll usually stay in the pew and there will be several people who stay in the pews, not a ton, but there are some who stay. It's hard because I want to enter into that with him. Receiving the Eucharist is a very communal event and a communal moment. And so for him not to be able to do that is definitely difficult knowing that we love the same Jesus and we know the same Jesus. For me personally, yeah, it's, it's tough to see her go up and, and receive the Eucharist and communion without me. It really is. The one that I love the most is sitting right next to me and, and able to partake when I'm not. Just as whenever the, the cups are being passed at my tradition and she doesn't partake, it, it's still, there's still a little bit of uneasiness because it is feeling like we're not completely unified. I love my fiance and my future husband, but Christ is my ultimate. And I too wish that I could share in that communal event with them. I really think that until we, as Catholic Christians and other Christians, see the pain that this moment of sacramental disunity has for these couples, we'll never get past our divisions. We need to feel their pain. You know, when I'm in Amy's church, and I go forward and cross my arms instead of holding my hands out to receive. The Catholic priest knows what that means and gives me a blessing. It's still very painful, and so I always try to turn that pain into a prayer and say, oh, for the day, oh, for the day. And what that is short for is, oh, for the day when Amy and I can legitimately, without dishonoring either stream, share the table of the Lord, the you know, a sign of unity of the body of Christ together as a married couple. And I believe that day will be in our lifetime. Even though it is kind of a, a man-made construct, in my opinion, that we're not necessarily able to partake together, I think we both understand the true meaning that we are partaking together, but just not at the same time. To really enter into a dialogue with another human being slash Protestant, Catholic, whatever, it takes the depth of understanding of self and of understanding of what Christ is calling you to that is so beyond our understanding of what world actually is. I think that's part of the mystery of the Trinity too and how the Spirit is working through us and pulling us all together. The miracle of the doctrine of the Trinity is that it does the impossible. It maintains diversity and unity at the same time. Three, one, one, three, three, one, one, three. How can they both be true? We have to succeed at the same thing. Somehow we have to honor and even protect diversity and know that the only way that that diversity is overcome is by a, a flow of love. If you take the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or the Athanasian Creed, which are the three primary creeds of the church. Not one of those three creeds on which the majority of the church worldwide bases itself ever says a single thing about love. Not one word. And yet, when Jesus was accosted by a bunch of scriptural lawyers, Torah scholars, and they asked him, What's the greatest commandment? He said, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's called the Shema. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We need to understand love as a, this robust energy that comes from God who gives and sacrifices. And, and the way I like to put it is this, God calls us to follow Jesus and come and die. And then he raises us in the power of new life and gives us the Holy Spirit and fills us with the love that will die and sacrifice. That's the love that will go to the other person 
And that's the costly love that will build the bonds of relationship that can bring about meaningful answers to the prayer of Jesus for unity. I think that part of the challenge of being a follower of Christ and loving Christ is learning to love across those barriers. Because I'm a disciple of Christ, I see you as someone God loves and someone I love. My starting point isn't suspicion, is he one of us? My starting point is the love of Christ. I'm interested in how people live and how they love, not just what their opinions are. And I am doing that because I actually believe that's what Jesus stood for. I don't think anywhere in Jesus' mind was the idea that let's start this big religion and name it after me. <laughs> and, let's, and let's have millions and millions of dollars and wealth and let's have political power. I just don't think that was in Jesus' mind. I think what Jesus was much more about is saying, I am about forming a community that is about love. The neighbor isn't just who you expect to be your neighbor. Your neighbor really is every divine image bearer, every other human being. If that's really true, how is our formation cultivating people who recognize that and who put that into practice? The irony for me is when people think, how do we get Catholics and Protestants together? Well, trying to do that without getting back to that basic message of love feels to me like a losing battle and an impossible challenge. Almost all of our religious communities were convened around a system of beliefs and how I think the, the really deep question now is can we reconvene around a way of life which is a way of love. As a theologian I would never want to say that you don't put belief prominently. It's just that belief is not abstracted from practice. When Jesus said follow me he didn't say as long as you say what I said I don't care what you do. He wants people to proclaim and he wants people to practice. What you cannot do is say there's an asterisk when it comes to loving neighbor. Every person is your neighbor. That's why I would much rather just focus on saying to be a follower of Christ is to become a disciple or a student in the way of love.